haven't been here quite a year yet. It's been uh, about uh, seven painful months, <laughs> of, uh, getting to figure everything out, getting to meet everyone. Uh, but also for me, which has been the incredible pleasure and the joy of being here, and one of the reasons I came here is to be at a school uh, that has planning, uh, that has landscape architecture, uh, that has urban design, that has all of the different fields that go with the built environment. Uh, when I was a student at Harvard, I was there the year that they brought in urban planning. Uh, urban planning had sort of disappeared there for a time, had gone over to the Kennedy School of Government, mm -hmm. and, uh, and they decided in 1994 that it was time uh, to bring back an urban planning program. And so for me, that really was the heart of my architectural education was understanding that urban planning was an integral and important piece of it. But it was also very formative to be there as we were talking about the future of the program to, to teach there uh, for many years. Um, as we were dealing with things that urban planning brought to the table uh, that the other design fields simply were not. And so I spent the last 11 years before I came here at Yale and uh, uh, really beautiful campus, uh, not as close to New York as I thought uh, when I moved there, um, but uh, no urban planning, uh, no urban design, no landscape, just architecture. And many people thought it was an incredible luxury to be at a place that was only about building, but instead it felt insular, it felt claustrophobic. Uh, it felt as though we had turned everything in the built environment into an idea of some kind of beautiful autonomous object on tabula rasa blank. Um, it was a nice abstract way, uh, but it wasn't the way that I wanted to engage with the world. And so when this position became available, and I looked at a couple of other positions as well, this is the one I really wanted. And it was the robustness and the quality of the planning program here that made me really want to come here. Because I think very much about how we can leave and how it can change the field, the other fields of design. Uh, the future is not architecture and the future is not landscape architecture. The future is our urban fabric. This is what we have to be thinking about, what we have to be focusing on. It's a messy fabric. Uh, it's a very messy fabric. And, and what I love about the fields that we deal with in the built environment is that we have to address that conflict in everything that we do. Everything is compromised. Everything is a series of difficult and negotiated decisions across sort of multiple types of domains, multiple kinds of constituents. You know, for me, it's, it's actually incredible to be challenged in that particular way. And so having been here now since July, uh, and having an opportunity to meet all of the planning faculty, uh, having an opportunity to hear uh, many of their talks, and most importantly, uh, having had an opportunity to see what their research is, um, you know, it brings me to tears uh, to, to realize that uh, this place can actually really make a difference in the world. Um, I'm adamant uh, that within five years, that people will be looking to the University of Texas as dealing with the most important problems that our society is facing. And I don't mean just the University of Texas, I mean the School of Architecture here. Uh, because we can deal with all of the issues of the built environment. And you all, and I'm assuming you're coming, <laughs> you all are gonna be a big piece of that. And what I hope, and I'm also very excited about, uh, this is the first class of students that I've had a chance to meet since yeah. the first part of the first admission cycle. Uh, so as far as I'm concerned, you're all my people. Uh, <laughs> I look forward to meeting each and every one of you, perhaps uh, you know, sitting on, on whether you're doing a PhD and sitting in on your exams, uh, sitting in on reviews uh, of your work, uh, being annoying sometimes at that, but, uh, but here to learn from you and hopefully uh, be able to find ways that we can pull all these things together because the built environment really needs our help right now. And it's an incredible time to be studying this. This is an incredible place to, to be. Another reason for being in Texas is that all of the difficult issues facing the design of the built environment are happening here. And the other reason for being here is the university is incredibly committed to how we think the future. 
and Planet Texas 2050, which you're just about to hear about, is something that you know we would talk about these kinds of ideas in the Ivy League, but it would be in terms of a conversation, a symposium. Instead, what's happening here is a long-term concerted research project that involves multiple entities and multiple voices. I've never seen uh, a multidisciplinary research project designed as well as this particular project is. So it's really exciting. And I think I'm turning it over to you first before, it's just gonna help you a whole series of these introductions. <laughs> but anyway, introduce yourself to me. I've told people that I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm good with faces, I'm terrible with names. I will call you all kinds of different <laughs> names uh, throughout the year. It'll take me 10 or 11 times before I get it right. Uh, so that should be right at your graduation. Uh, that I'll finally <laughs> get it. But, I, but I'll recognize your faces. Thank you, Maddie, for your remarks. My name is Min, Min Zhang. I'm the faculty coordinator for uh, Tiki Forum. Just this year, uh, part of the team, we have uh, <coughs> Forum is a planning and urban issues speaker series hosted by CRC, AU Austin. The series is intended to broaden the curriculum and the service program by presenting experiences, perspectives, and insights of scholars, community leaders, practicing planners, and policymakers who engage in timely issues. Topics of discussion are relevant, contemporary issues, ranging from the local and regional. International. City Forum provides a space for open, critical dialogue among faculty members, students, community members, planning practitioners, and policymakers regarding crucial planning related issues in Austin and elsewhere. The speaker series is intended to encourage discussion of diversity, multiple po politics, and social change. Um, so that's the formal um, description of. In the past, we have invited uh, speakers from different fields and different uh, areas. I'll just give you a few examples here. Uh, we had earlier the year affordable living in community engaged design. Once again, um, roadblocks in Austin's housing market for people with criminal records. Who Flood emergency response, Hurricane Harvey. All of the above, transmitting equity law, practice, and advocacy. So all kinds of uh, topics, a wide range of uh, coverage of um, the last year, last semester in uh, academic year, has uh, built a career in planning insights from CRC and UNI, facing an antiquity of historic city and modern metropolis. So you can see kind of a wide range of uh, topics. We uh, ask students for input. So we have a topic, the speakers that we like to have, and then um, schedule the speaker series for uh, each semester. Today, we have a very special session. We have our in-house distinguished uh, scholars, uh, two, pr uh, two professors in CRC. Uh, earlier of the day, they have already introduced Sure. All right. Okay. Do you want to come up too, just to say hi at the beginning? Or? Um, hi. 
I guess we did speak to a lot of you this morning, but I'm Catherine Liebernecht. I'm an assistant professor here in the planning program. Hello, everybody. My name is Chi Xin Jiao. I'm an assistant professor in the Lin Chang as well. Nice yeah. to see you. Yeah, it's good to see everyone again. Um, so I think our plan for today is we've been asked to come talk about two of these um, research grand challenge yes. programs that are getting started up by UT Austin. And it's been kind of a process from the fall of 2016. So um, I was going to give a little background uh, overview, I guess, and then speak about one specifically called Planet Texas 2050. And then Dr. Jow will be speaking about a different one called Good Systems. Um, so, and I think as far as I'm concerned, please ask questions as, you know, during my part, and then we'll hold like kind of discussion and big questions for the end. But if you're not getting something or want me to repeat it, please just type up. Um, and if I get too quiet, let me know. <laughs> and I'll speak back up again too. I haven't been in this classroom for a while. Um, anything else? That's it. Uh, feel free to ask uh, questions. Yeah, yeah, lots of questions is, is good. I, we've been, um, we're starting to kind of trot out these dog and pony shows for this program. But this is the first time we've spoken to students, first time I've spoken to students about it. So I'm really interested to get your feedback and just kind of what makes sense and why are you choosing this, this way. So just so I remember what we're doing, um, we're going to kind of, for your guidance too. So we're going to talk about bridging barriers broadly, and then Planet Texas 2050, oh, squeak, and then Good Systems. And I'm going to spend five minutes of my time talking about a particular research project, which has no name yet, so I was going to get feedback on that too. So no name, <laughs> but fund it, <laughs> research project. So I thought I'd try to crowdsource that. So I'm, I really want to get to that, so I'm going to set myself a 14-minute timer so I don't run out of time for that, because to me that's critical, um, and get some slides up. All right, well, great. Well, thanks for having us here. Like I said, this is pretty exciting to be able to get feedback from students um, and other faculty about this process. Um, just to kind of preface it, um, the two programs that we're talking about today are part of this larger initiative at the uh, University of Texas at Austin, um, which is kind of un under even a larger umbrella of a research grand challenge. So a lot of research universities now are putting together these grand challenge programs, initiatives. And the gist of it is, and like we we're kind of talking about this morning in our intros, um, trying to harness the value of these large research universities and, and the interdisciplinary nature of them, working kind of across silos to um, generate knowledge and solutions that can really be used to address big societal problems. Um, so this is UT Austin's iteration of it. They're calling their research grand challenge program Bridging Barriers. And this is kind of their definition, that it, it, it's ambitious, but you can solve it. So it's not, <laughs> we can actually get there. Um, that we're leveraging our interdisciplinary <laughs> research capacity here. So kind of harnessing what makes UT Austin, UT Austin. And we're directing it towards these big grand challenges, these societal problems. Um, so about, I guess, 18 months ago, our president, uh, President Fembes, kicked off this Bridging Barriers Grand Challenge program. And he put out a call for um, concept papers, just two-page papers. And the idea was that you had to work across disciplines. So you, had to, you couldn't just sit down as a group of planners and write up one of these papers. You had to kind of work um, across the university. And the idea was just put down in a couple pages what you think some of the biggest pressing problems are. If you could address any problem in the world, what would you think about? Um, and I, I have to say, I'll brag on this, the planning program, I mean, we probably have 10 full-time faculty. I don't even know. Ish, we're pretty small, relatively speaking. Most planning programs are, right? Um, we generate a huge number of these concept papers, and they're really well received. And I just wanted to point out Dr. Shara, who's here too, who also was kind of in this early process as well, and is a veteran of it. <laughs> and so please pipe up, chime in with all, all this as well. Um, so anyway, the, the university put out the call for these concept papers, and they got, I think, over 120 of them. And then they sorted through them, probably had I don't know who they had sort through them, but someone read them all multiple times and put them into six themes. And then for each of those themes, they called in six or eight faculty and said, hey, can you try to like wrangle this stack of concept papers and make something coherent out of it as far as a potential research plan? So I was called in to work on what eventually became Planet Texas 2050. Um, but at the time, it was called something like environment, sustainability, habitat, and security, and it was <laughs> it was interdisciplinary, so much so it was hard to know where to start. So an engineer, and a planner, and uh, an English professor, and an archaeologist, 
um, a geologist, and then a, an astronomer who was there to represent this group of concept papers that basically were making the argument that we need to find a new planet. <laughs> like if we can't get to resilient Texas by 2050, we need to go elsewhere. So they came to the first two meetings and then they like just went off by themselves. Like they couldn't bridge that barrier. They, they just kind of did their own thing. But the rest of us stuck together and we're still working together for the most part. Um, so that's the, the grand challenge. And, and the idea again is just kind of harness just the capacity of these research universities, which makes sense. And this is why I hope you are considering UT Austin that we are a public university, you know, so we, part of our mission is giving back to the state of Texas and beyond, and we are the flagship university here in Texas, which, I mean, say what you will, it's an amazing state in the sense that, as we talked about this morning, pretty much anything you can think of concerning planning of the built environment is happening here in a fairly extreme way <laughs> in some cases as well. Um, so, so that's a uh, grand challenge. Um, and I, I won't dwell much more on that just to kind of give you the frame like why this is happening. So the Planet Texas 2050 program under that Bridging Barriers Grand Challenge Research initi Initiative is one of these six themes that's kind of evolved into this research program. And we actually kicked off officially this January. Um, and it, it's been a little slow going. We've been working out governance and how do things work and how, who has a chairship and you know, kind of the, the nitty gritty of trying to create this interdisciplinary program where we all get along. Uh, you guys probably know, but it, there aren't a lot of incentives for interdisciplinary research um, for various reasons. We all produce different types of knowledge, so you know the peer review articles that we need to generate are really different than a design, which is very different from a single author manuscript. So there's lots of reasons why interdisciplinary stuff is hard. Um, this has been working pretty well. It's just taken a little while to kind of work out the kinks. But the good news is that this summer, our first research projects are off the ground. So I'm going to talk about that. That's why I want to talk about the last five minutes. Um, good. But just to give you kind of a quick overview of what this is about, it really is just thinking about how do we get to a resilient Texas by the year 2050. So this is a very Texas title, right? Planet Texas. <laughs> Think big. Um, so it's, it's a little, maybe a little silly, but the idea really is, yeah, everything that, any challenge that you can think about with resiliency pretty much is happening here in Texas. So maybe if we can figure it out here in Texas, um, we can share some of the knowledge that we generate and the strategies that we come up with with communities to think about resiliency, which we're kind of defining in an old school, kind of back from the 70s ecological definition way, just the ability to, to recover from disturbance, the ability to bounce back from disturbance. And then we've kind of layered other things, maybe not even just bounce back, but maybe get to a better place even. And then also a third thing we've kind of layered on is thinking about especially resilience as it pertains to vulnerable communities, because sometimes that piece is left out. Um, so yeah, so Plan Texas 2050, really our, our goal is uh, to achieve um, a healthy, safe, just, economically vibrant Texas in 2050. And I can tell you, like, every one of those words was hours of discussion. <laughs> does it go in, does it not? Is, you know, is it a too radical a word? But, um, but that's what we're getting for, go, going towards. And I just wanted to pause and think about that, because who here is from Texas or grew up in Texas? Yeah, so a good chunk of us. We know that Texas isn't, as a baseline for everyone who lives here, we're not already achieving this, right? This is not achieved yet. So the idea is that we've got work to do already to make sure that Texas is healthy and safe and just and economically vibrant for everyone who's already here. And then thinking by 2050, when we know we're going to be seeing population growth, probably, we're about 28 million today, and the low end population estimates for 2050 are about 41 million or maybe a higher end over 50 million. So not quite doubling, but getting close. Um, so thinking about all those people here today and then adding even more people and thinking about what kind of place we want Texas to be as far as um, uh, you know, the ability to, it, to be a good home, good habitat for all of us who are living here. So just quickly to get back to this, this is kind of the wrangling with the interdisciplinary nature of this, just thinking about drawing knowledge from all these different fields. Um, and actually the archeologist, no surprise, maybe came up with this metaphor, which kind of works, is that we each have a piece of the puzzle and we're all trying to put it together and then kind of see the big picture. And then also the puzzles are kind of synergistic too, so you're kind of creating new things as well. Um, so at this point, you know, we have good representation from many, many disciplines. But the gist of the program um, is A, we're just trying to gather any existing data out there that would help us build resilient communities in Texas, um, and then find out where the gaps are, find out what new data we need to generate to kind of address resiliency issues in Texas, integrate that data in a database so the pieces talk to each other. So when we think about building new roads, we can think about the impact 
on housing, on an urban heat island effect, and energy consumption. So trying to integrate the pieces of data in a database and then use that integrated database to develop what we in planning called scenarios, but other disciplines call models, and we, could, we also call them models sometimes too. But think about kind of pictures of the future of Texas, different types of futures for Texas, more or less resilient, more or less fair and equitable and safe and healthy and uh, economically viable. And then after we do that, generate those scenarios, think about, okay, if we want to get to this place, what are the strategies and tools that we need to develop with communities to um, kind of provide a portfolio, a toolbox, that places around Texas, communities, municipalities, nonprofits, business leaders can use to achieve resiliency by 2050. So it's kind of a three-part plan, kind of grab all the data, integrate it, do scenario planning and modeling, and then come up with the tools. And it's iterative. I mean, we're talking already about tools now because you have to kind of figure out what kind of data you need to get the kind of tools that you want. So it's not that clear cut, it's more integrated. But that's the gist of it. Um, and there's lots of different ways to phrase this. I know Steven Richter's here, he's a doctoral student in planning and he's taking this um, Planet Texas graduate seminar that we're hosting this year over in the Jackson School. Um, so he can chime in. I know he's had some discussions about, hey, you could frame it other ways besides these two main drivers. But it, within this interdisciplinary group, the way we decided to frame it was, okay, thinking out to 2050, we know in Texas we'll have more people here, which is a great thing, right? I mean, more people means more economic activity. It means more people to you know, get to know and interact with them at the city scale, become more tolerant about. But it also means that if we don't keep up and plan for it, we're gonna be used, having the same resource base um, that we need to share with more people. And in addition to that, if we don't plan for it, we're not gonna have enough infrastructure <coughs> and services, right? by 2050. So that's one big driver we're thinking about. And then the other one is climate change, um, and especially kind of the extreme weather events that um, result from climate change. So knowing that those two things are coming down the line and are already happening now are kind of the two drivers that we're trying to consider. And this is just a little infographic from the Water Development Board, which is our water planning agency, just to give you a sense by 2030 uh, if you can see it in the back, just how some of these major metro areas in Texas will see population growth, but also have less water for various reasons. Um, some of them relate to climate change. So that's kind of the, the real nature of that. Um, and again, you can kind of see different areas in Texas that will see even more population growth. Um, as you guys know, I'm sure, w the other thing kind of lurking behind this is that um, most people in Texas already live in, in cities, right, or metropolitan areas. So even though I know we have an image of Texas wide open spaces and like blue bonnets and cowboys, and that's all true too, but most of the people are in the metro areas. And that's a, another big piece of this, the urbanization piece. Um, just quickly, so climate change, right? So this is, if you go to the bathroom right now and turn on the tap, your water comes eventually from Lake Travis, from the chain of lakes in the hill country. So this is a photo of Lake Travis in 2011. This was the big drought that we recently left. And these limestone cliffs are beautiful, but you're not supposed to be able to see them because <laughs> the water is like supposed to be up there, right? Um, so this is the midst of the drought. It's filled back up again, and we're not thinking about water planning as much now because of that. But the, the impact of climate shifts is already happening here. So thinking about even more extreme over time is kind of the driving factor. And then as I said, because we're Texas, we're thinking about what happens in our state and the strategies that we can develop for our state, but assuming that they will probably have some applicability outside our state. That um, looking around the US at other places, experiencing population growth, experience climate change, some of the knowledge and the strategies that we generate will probably have some use outside of our state boundaries and maybe even around the world. So it's, it's Texas, but it's beyond. So anyway, these are the other seven people I've been being interdisciplinary with <laughs> the past like 12 months at this point. So it's been really interesting. I mean, I've never really, you know, I took English classes as an undergrad, but it's been a long time since I thought about representation and, you know, just, just the way that different temperaments and different kind of research questions interact in disciplines has been interesting um, and, and a little challenging. But, and we've done a lot of these terrible bubble models as a way to try to like everyone get their voice in for their discipline. So, but this is basically what I was just talking to you about. Our research plan is gather all the data, integrate it, do the modeling and scenario planning, and come up with the strategies. The one thing I haven't mentioned yet is that we, because you have to limit it somehow, and this is probably already too big in scope as it is, um, to four main research areas kind of under the Planet Texas umbrella. So thinking about water issues, 
And that could be water supply, it could be flooding, it could be drought, uh, water infrastructure in a city, metropolitan area, right? Um, energy issues, you know, how much energy we use, where it's coming from, energy conservation, uh, the in interaction of energy with these other sectors as well. Ecosystem services, which are just the benefits that nature provides. Usually we think about provides the people, but really provides more broadly as well. Uh, so things like temper temperature regulation or flood regulation, um, production of clean water. And the last one is urbanization. So if you think about those four research bins, the built environment broadly, the school of architecture broadly, and planning really specifically, <coughs> touches on all four of those. And to me, I think this has been, besides the interdisciplinary piece of it that I've really enjoyed really thinking about, hey, how do we make this relevant to a humanities perspective? That piece has been fun. But the other piece that's really kind of blown my mind is that so much of this has to do with planning. And this is a significant, I didn't mention this piece, but this is a significant investment from UT Austin. It's an eight-year research project. They're investing internally eight to $10 million for the research program, just for this piece, right? And then the piece that Dr. Zhao will talk about has its own funding pool. And then we're expected that we'll probably bring in an additional $40 million to that 10 million um, through foundations, through external grants. I mean, it'll be a lot of work, but there's an expectation through private donations. So this is like a $50 million research project over eight years that's basically focused on planning for resiliency in the state of Texas, which you know to me is pretty remarkable. So four research areas, urbanization, ecosystem services, water and energy. Um, the other thing, and I, maybe I'll leave this piece a little bit so we can kind of get into some of the other stuff, but um, in addition to thinking about disciplines, we're thinking about kind of time scales. So this is kind of where the archeologists come into it, thinking about um, impacts of population and climate, not just today, but what we can take away from past societies and learn from. Um, you can't just kind of pop your toolbox or your strategies from ancient Mayans and say, hey, this is how we're gonna deal with water issues today in Austin, but you can take general trends and information and kind of use them to inform the decisions that we make in the future. So that's another piece of this as well, in addition to thinking about those research areas. Um, and then the last piece before we kind of get into more of the kind of what's upcoming for the research programs is I think a critical piece of this has been thinking about kind of the iterative back and forth development of this research program with communities up front. So not, the idea is not we're gonna gather all this data, do all this scenario planning, create this toolbox and just kind of put it out there and say, hey, good luck, you know, communities. From the very beginning, we're starting right now, um, we're seeking as much input as possible from places around Texas, you know, municipal leaders, community leaders, nonprofits, the business sector, to think about um, what kind of questions we should be asking, what kind of projects we should be investing in, what kind of data we need to gather, where are the gaps, what's already out there? There must be tons of stuff out there that's already kind of gathered, you know, instead of reinventing the wheel, trying to gather that. So that's one piece of that kind of community back and forth. And the other piece we're really thinking about is how do we, and this is kind of where my colleagues in humanities come in, how do we think about um, communicating and doing outreach and representation of these ideas of climate change and population growth in Texas? So these are a couple examples uh, of representation um, that Heather put together. So this is um, an image of Onion Creek, which is one of our flashier creeks here. If you guys have been around for a little bit, you know that it, it does flood quite a bit and we've actually had loss of life from it. And the artist has a kind of map the flood line somehow with white, so kind of showing that. And this, if you guys were around a couple years ago, um, is called Thirst, and um, Bilai Lu, I believe, is, was a faculty member. I think she is still here at UT Austin, along with other collaborators. But what they did to kind of represent climate, the climate change that was happening, the drought that was happening, was that they took this dead oak tree, I think. Uh, actually, it was from Tito's Vodka's ranch, <laughs> and it died, and Tito, Mr. Tito, donated the tree and they, the artist painted it white and then hauled it over to the lake and kind of attached it to the cement block. And the idea here, if you guys know about the Colorado River through downtown, we call it a lake, but it's the river, it's maintained at a constant level. So even when we were in that huge drought, you would go downtown and walk on the lake and everything was green and the water was still. So there was no feedback loop, like, whoa, we're in crisis, there's a drought. The idea was like, hey, here's a feedback loop. <laughs> you know, here's a ghost tree. It's supposed to mimic the ghost spikes that are around town, yeah. Anyway, so I know that often when we talk about interdisciplinary stuff, we say, oh yeah, yeah, we need everything. There's been such a conscious effort here to really think about 
not just tacking on the humanities at the end when you say, hey, communities, here's our you know, toolbox, but really trying to integrate different ways of viewing information from the very beginning. Um, so just a couple examples of that. So just a couple things before I talk a little bit about the research project, kind of where we are in our timeline for Planet Texas 2050. Like I said, we've been kind of wrangling with the governance and the metrics and kind of setting up this interdisciplinary research project. Um, we do have a website and we've kind of started communication. Here's, is it still up? It's pretty, I like, it's a pretty nice website, I think, actually. <laughs> this is kind of the other fun thing to have these resources from the university to do these things for us. Um, anyway, so it's worth checking out. I think it's just, yeah, it's Bridging Barriers, Texas. If you just Google that, it'll show up. Um, so we're starting kind of the outreach and communication. Um, we're starting that listening tour that I was talking about to start gathering data now from communities, from business leaders. Um, and we've outsourced to the Texas Advanced Computing Center to um, begin the initial stages of putting together that data platform where we'll be gather, um, integrating the data that we gather. And then this summer, we're going to kick off research projects. Um, and we've also already started doing some of these outreach activities as well. So I want to talk a little about, about these research activities. So this is kind of the initial seed funding put up for, by the university for the first 18 months or so. Um, so it's just a small selection of some of the projects that were floated. And there'll be an open call for proposals next year. So it'll be opened up more broadly. Um, but if you look kind of through these project names, a lot of them do really touch on the built environment, planning specifically, and you can kind of get a sense of a little bit of the interdisciplinary nature. So uh, there's going to be an artist in residence for Planet Texas 2050 who's going to be studying what she calls the gray belt. So we talk about the green belt of green space around our city, but the gray belt's like the water infrastructure that's hidden. So she's going to do a tour of the water infrastructure and film it and kind of do a performance art piece. Um, you know, matched by how much water is there in Texas, like very practical, like let's measure how much water we have, how much do we need. Um, meaning making and justice, so big focus on justice issues kind of woven throughout and human nature interactions. Um, this is the one I want to talk about for a second, the data platform idea for metropolitan areas. Urban watersheds, um, pre-modern urban environments and stress, transportation related air pollutants and health. So kind of the nexus of some of the energy pieces and the urbanization pieces. So the one I want to talk about today is one that came from that concept paper that some of the planning faculty put together with faculty from maybe like six or seven other units 18 months ago. And we thought, you know, if we could do anything, what would we want to do? And what we wanted to do was to create um, an integrated data platform about urbanization processes which kind of sound, I know that sounds like not very catchy, but it is really important. <laughs> it's like a research project that only nerds could love. But the idea is that there's this immense urbanization happening here in Texas and around the world. And like I was saying, we, ha we know there's all this data about it, but it's not connected. So then it's hard to see how the, the nexus between all these pieces impacts all the other pieces. So the idea is that the metropolitan scale, and if you look throughout Texas, there's kind of 25 of these metropolitan areas. Can you just have one online place where all the data, and here's an example of the data we already know is out there. I know you can't read that, but it's kind of the point that there's so much of it. This is all information that's already out there, but it's not linked up at the metropolitan scale. So if you're thinking about transportation, you know, to be able to connect it to immediately to housing affordability or to water use, right, or energy use would be really useful. So the idea is just trying to integrate all that existing data, find the gaps where we need new data, at the metropolitan scale, because again, like I said, that's where the majority of people live in Texas. Um, and then use that to answer research questions, many of them about metropolitan form, urban form. You know, is there a new metropolitan form in Texas, in, in Texas cities? Is there what we're calling an urban inversion, where the poor households are being forced out of the inner parts of the city, the denser parts of the city, are now in kind of parts of the suburban areas that don't have the same services and infrastructure <coughs> that they need. So questions that we've all been thinking about, but it's a little hard to answer without kind of all the pieces of the puzzle. And in addition to that, having this platform be a place where we can share the information that we generate, the knowledge we generate, and the toolbox. So it's kind of like Planet Texas, but at a smaller scale, at the metropolitan scale. And this is the thing we've been kind of thinking about as, as a faculty group for a while. 
Yeah. Anyway, um, I'll just um, end with that, but I wanted to get your feedback. So originally we were going to call this the Texas Urban Observatory, um, which was Michael Oden's name, and I thought it, was, it had a nice internal rhyme. I loved it. But the physical scientists on the committee just couldn't stand it because they're like, well, it's not an observatory. You're not looking at stars. You're looking at cities. <laughs> and then I found out that the head of research, Dr. Dan Jaffe, is an astronomer, and he was like, no. <laughs> so, and we had another name, and it was too similar to someone else's name. So I've been asking people to give me names. So, so far, these are some of the names for that integrated data platform at the metropolitan scale. So I brought some index cards. If you guys want to put down a name that you like or if you have another idea, I'd love to hear it. Once you name something, you can't really change the name. <laughs> So I want to get it right. Um, and then, you know, if you also want to give me feedback on the other side of the index card, if you were able to go online and look at your metropolitan area and find any kind of data you wanted, what would you want to find out? Or, you know, what, what do you think is missing? Or what do you think is important? So um, I'll pass these up out while Dr. Yaw gets his slide. Oh, OK. Yeah, well, I'm done. So OK, thanks. So I'm going to pull up Dr. Jow's slides. There you go. Yeah. Um, thank you everyone, mm -hmm. and thank you, um, Dr. Rizek, for the wonderful introduction about the, what the uh, memory barrier is. And there, we are lucky, there, um, we have two actually, uh, plus two of our techs are getting involved in the data. So Dr. Rizinak and Ruby was the lead of the time in Texas and you can see hopefully um, well. Thank you. Um, I'm uh, one of the ten members for this uh, good system uh, uh, initiative. So I will briefly talk about what it is. So um, just like uh, um, Planet Texas, we were uh, mapping out our idea about uh, uh, our title and uh, this term go system is uh, after uh, I would say hundreds of hours of what the Smith process and people are still thinking uh, we want to change it to a different title um, <laughs> because we have a uh, 10 different uh, interdisciplinary scholars so uh, it's very <laughs> not easy to get the uh, term set up so but the uh, from this picture, you can see the structure of this uh, uh, theme. So uh, at the bottom, uh, we have two, like uh, we have a, a system. We're trying to develop a system. And uh, we have two separate structure. On your left hand, it's related to data. On the right hand, it's related to uh, built environment. And, uh, uh, faculty from School of Architecture, like uh, Dr. Patson and Dr. Zhang, and, uh, and somebody else uh, also uh, from our team. It's uh, basically within this built environment uh, section, and I'm also in the built environment section. Closely related to the built environment section is the transportation section, and uh, on top of that is the health section. Uh, on the left hand, uh, we have a uh, data science and a uh, cultural heritage and human AI. That's a uh, structure of this uh, topic. Uh, if you ask me what exactly Go system is, based on my understanding, we're trying to develop, uh, uh, use uh, information to develop a uh, system to evaluate uh, um, current uh, technology, what's good technology, what's not so good technology, what's, uh, um, what is a bad technology. That's uh, what we're doing here. We have uh, 10 different team members. Um, we have a professor from English, and we have a professor from high school, and we have two professors from Pierce Stone uh, from computer science, and they're uh, Bruce Porter, also from computer science, uh, and uh, we have a professor from uh, transportation uh, medical school, and uh, I'm the one from architecture. So basically, you can see uh, it's a combination of uh, many, many different fields. So 
and uh, we are still trying to, uh, not like uh, Dr. Nivnek already put this puzzle together, we're still trying to, we, we should say we are 80% down, but we should, uh, we're still working to make this uh, more cohesive and uh, make like one piece. That's uh, yeah. our state right now. So uh, a big part of this good system is related to computer science and the data. So one major topic is how the artificial intelligence is going to change our society. That's the first uh, topic of this uh, good system. I will just uh, uh, zip through it and uh, uh, we will, uh, if you have a question, you can ask me uh, later. And there another part, uh, each, each section is a separate uh, research topic. Just like Planet Texas, we have uh, many, many different uh, topics but each of this is a separate topic. This is related to cultural heritage. Uh, this is led by two professors at uh, high school and the English department. Data science, again. So <laughs> how do we combine different messy and uh, incomplete data and uh, trying to use that uh, to help us make uh, decisions? And uh, uh, we will collect a lot of data uh, from virtual reality or to the small uh, smartphone and uh, to the 3D videos, and this is also a big part of the process. Health, as is related to the built environment already. So uh, we have two professors from Dara Medical School. We're trying to understand how basically our environment gonna affect people's health. Use uh, again use data and use uh, uh, artificial intelligence as a driver to understand that. Transportation, uh, we are actually uh, closely related to this topic. Um, some of you might be called for the research opportunity in this topic. This is led by a CTR professor called Dr. Chandra Bhatt and uh, James Crew, um, who is a research scientist at the uh, Center for Transportation Planning. This topic basically trying to understand how the internet of things, like uh, wearables, also collect uh, vehicles, also uh, driverless cars gonna change our urban uh, environment. And the, the potential health impact. This is where we are uh, built environment. Uh, uh, hopefully I'm gonna lead this uh, uh, research topic. So we want to use uh, big data and the internet of things to create a detailed evaluation system to evaluate our built environment, to measure and to quantify the existing environment and uh, trying to understand how this uh, different environment gonna affect uh, our behavior, uh, our many, many different uh, behavior. Uh, and then we will use uh, crowdsourcing to, uh, to collect this data. Um, and eventually we hope to develop a system uh, to promote good uh, urban planning by, by, by learning from uh, success and failure uh, in the past. So this is what this topic about. Okay, we have uh, uh, seven uh, different uh, topic areas. So where are we right now? Uh, we're still, as I said, we're still in the final phase to put this uh, puzzle together and there hopefully will be launched in 2019 fall. Uh, so if you come here in 2018 fall, the fall we will be ready to hire GRA one year <laughs> <laughs> after you get here. Um, so uh, before before I move on, I will say uh, Dr. Liebknecht mentioned this is a UT devote a huge huge amount of money to this project. We're like uh, according to our provost and the president, they wrote locate eight million dollar to each of these and we are supposed to apply for external funding to support us and uh, totally it's be a very big number um, and so this is a this is a great research opportunity for 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 all of you so while we are waiting uh, for this uh, to be finally approved and uh, uh, launched so we are doing some external uh, grant writing uh, project. So uh, as I said, we're supposed to attract external grant. So uh, this is, uh, I'm going to talk about two potential grants. 
wines uh, uh, one grant is we submitted to the DD as uh, one transportation network company uh, in China like uh, Uber and Lyft. We're trying to understand how uh, multi-mode transportation planning process should work and uh, they will, if they fund it, they will, they will let me know and let the team know in the week, maybe two, whether they will fund this. Uh, basically, we're trying to understand how to incorporate uh, transportation network company uh, in their modern city uh, planning process, just like a bus, car, or bicycle. And if funded, we will be about to hire two uh, graduate research assistants for one year. Uh, another, uh, okay, this is a DD website. If you have not checked out uh, their website, their, uh, their huge TNC transportation network company. And there's the only one willing to share data. So that's, uh, that's very, very interesting. DD, like a Uber and Lyft, they never want research, uh, they never want to release any data. So that's two advantage. Another one is we just submitted an uh, NSF grant uh, with uh, Dr. Dan and Dr. Patterson. So also from other team members from uh, um, um, Good System. So this one is basically we're trying to use uh, data to understand how to uh, mm, create a smart and connected community. Um, this is currently under review. So if it is funded, uh, we will be able to at least uh, provide uh, two research graduate system opportunity for four years. And uh, for this grant, we actually worked with the uh, 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 city of Austin. They have a branch called Austin City Up. We worked uh, with the city of Austin and uh, uh, Intel, Cisco, uh, Dell, uh, this lead tech company. Uh, we're trying to use a uh, uh, second street as a living lab, uh, trying to understand how to collect all this sensor data and how to analyze this sensor data and how to use this uh, results to guide the future planning process of the second street. Um, I heard uh, no matter this funding come uh, through or not, the city of Austin will install the smart kiosks. So basically like uh, Kansas City or Toronto, you already have smart kiosks. Uh, in this uh, city of Austin, we will install uh, at least uh, eight smart kiosks. So we will get a chance to collect the data. And they already installed a lot of uh, sensors in this area. So uh, this is related to the second project. Um, so um, that's uh, for my uh, part of uh, presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, please email me. Uh, we want to know uh, specifically if you're interested in uh, uh, GIS transportation and uh, uh, built environment or smart city, please uh, let me know or let uh, uh, our faculty know we want to get you engaged in this process. Thank you. I guess I need to do this, right, so it's recorded. Yes, and so part of it is is we're still chicken and egg in it a little bit, so we're not into the research programs. I think the kind of the leadership teams that we're on have to be UT researchers, but not faculty necessarily. So we have two researchers on our team who aren't faculty members. Um, but certainly, um, UT is open to having practitioners work on some of these issues, to even having you know academics from other areas of the country or the world. And the majority of it needs to be UT Austin. But I think certainly for the projects that we, our teams are working on, there is real buy-in that there needs to be practitioner interface as well. Um, but we're not to the point yet where anything's mapped out, like, okay, this is how it's going to work. Some of the other projects that were floated, like I floated one that was more focused on kind of multi, optimizing green infrastructure, and that had a big uh, practitioner piece of it. So I think it depends on, on the specific research project too, but yeah, it's a great question. Um, and there's a lot of talking past each other, this could be dangerous. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I would love to say something about what you, I'm sure you have something to say. Um, thanks, Ted. That's a very good question. Uh, uh, in the beginning, I was, uh, uh, honestly, I was confused uh, <laughs> why we have a team member. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm being very honest. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, <laughs> But uh, when we move on, I, I find it super, super important to have an uh, English professor in the team. And uh, because it's an uh, interdisciplinary team project, we have a very, very hard time to communicate with each other. And uh, we have a limited uh, uh, ability to find the right r- word to put in the right place. And it's, uh, in the end, we found it's almost impossible to do the project without uh, our wonderful professor from English department, and uh, he, he, he's on the NS, NSF proposal too. So I think s- it's very, very important to, to have an uh, open mind to do interdisciplinary work. And uh, in the beginning, you may not realize uh, the importance, but uh, it's definitely very important, at least in my, uh, in my view. Yeah, it's been Heather Hauser is our team member, and it's been just critical having her. And I think I think we all were a little tickled about how interdisciplinary it was at the beginning. But um, part of it, this governance rollout that we've been doing, taking so long on, a lot of it has been language issues, how we define terms, how do you define resiliency, how do you define community. And she's been so helpful with that. And even just all these bubble diagrams we've been doing, we've been focused on, on these pillars, the pillar of climate change, the pillar of population growth. And she's like, well, we need a plinth, too. We need, like, a foundation where we all kind of understand what's happening. So we've talked a lot about those words and what goes there. And also community definitions as well. So, yeah, it's, it's been critical. And I, I think everyone's a little worried this is going to be kind of added on and not integrate it. But I would say it's been a critical piece of it. Other questions? Bob. Oh, sorry. Bob. I've got a question. Um, so I, I enjoyed the presentation, and I like your, the game challenge. Um, but it's interesting to listen to you both talk some of the publications from country and states and everything, the, the, the bridging portion of it, right? So as you look at, if you look into the field of sustainability science, right, we had, um, initially we talked about multidisciplinary engagement, then we discussed interdisciplinary engagement, but then within the field of sustainability, we actually talked about transdisciplinary engagement. So I'm kind of curious, as you're working forward towards your mission, have you had clarity when you use those terms about what those actually mean as distinct? Because you know, the notion of transdisciplinary right. is that you're actually combining teams of different disciplines to actually re- reframe and rethink what the question should be. Whereas in interdisciplinary, you're working as teams, but you're still kind of in your same disciplines. The multidisciplinary was kind of old school, and that's where we basically we had teams, but everyone had their silos, and at the end, put it together in a report and call it a day. And so, I, as most people would argue, within the within the realm of the social and and the hard sciences, that transdisciplinary, certainly within sustainability science, but transdisciplinary is supposed to be what we're our aspirations. I have something. Do you want to? Um, I can go first. Yeah, go. yeah. No, that's a great question. Um, we have continued, uh, I won't pull it up, but the way that um, kind of the Bridging Barriers initiative was described at the beginning has been this interdisciplinary effort, and that's the language that's continued to be used from the development office, from VPR's office. But we've had this discussion internally, this is another kind of definitional thing. It's actually been our archaeologist who's really been pushing on this, that in words, and using that word transdisciplinary, but we've kind of just stuck with it. But the idea is, yeah, we're supposed to be creating this new thing, new understandings, new research questions. I don't know if we'll get there. I mean, that's the idea. This is not supposed to just be a cash influx for everyone's existing research agendas, and we just kind of paste it together. We're really, to address these big challenges, you have to do exactly what you're saying. And I think that's to be seen. I mean, that's the hope. Um, And I also think it'll be a little easier to see in 18 months, because I think the first research projects that we're funding are more of that interdisciplinary model, because they were what we were able to cobble together quickly. Because, of course, the end of the fiscal year is coming, as you know, so we need to get something done. So we're kind of using those. But when there's an open call, and when we determine the metrics about how we choose what projects get funded forward, that will be a big piece of it. Are, Are we asking new questions and new framings, not just kind of, you know, giving out these doles of, of institutional money. So yeah, it's a great question. 
And it would be wonderful for someone to study that. I mean, I, no one's studying kind of this Bridging Barriers Initiative, but it, it kind of going back and looking at it, I think it'd be pretty fascinating. So yeah. Uh, I would just add uh, something. Uh, I think in the beginning, the title is uh, interdisciplinary uh, work, and that is extremely challenging. In, in my experience, so uh, extremely challenging to put together a, a common topic uh, from uh, uh, all the team members. And as I said, we're in still in the process uh, trying to put a, uh, our common topic together. And we actually have a meeting with uh, uh, VPR in early April to present our common topic. And uh, um, so uh, I think it's a learning process from uh, um, for both, for all the member, for all the team members. So like, uh, it's one one thing. Like, uh, uh, it's very likely everybody wants to do their own thing. That's become a, um, everybody get a piece of uh, funding. That's uh, will be considered a failure by the VPR. At, at least uh, they told me, uh, not they told us that. And uh, so it's it's important, but it's very difficult to form a, a topic with a multidiscipline, interdiscipline. I can go first. So I'm a uh, um, trained by uh, arch uh, architecture degree, but uh, when I uh, start my PhD, I became very interested in technology. And uh, when when I work with these uh, team members, I naturally uh, attracted to the technology side. Uh, that's good and bad. So, um, so we also have to think about the qualitative method or the humanity side. So I learned a lot from this uh, process. So sometimes we become a very, very technical in our topic and we have to pull back a little bit and uh, to think about a human factor in this process. So uh, yeah, so planning is uh, uh, interdisciplinary work by, by the definition. So we have to think about uh, both qualitative and quantitative, how technology and humanity work together. So that's a, that's the beauty of uh, planning, I'll say. Yeah, that's a great answer. Um, maybe just one quick example. Sometimes I feel, I mean, I, I, I do think planning is just an amazing discipline, and I, I don't want to be anything else. It's, it's the right fit um, for so many reasons. But sometimes it feels like we are too generalist, too, too, too much of a generalist as a field, like a little bit of this, a little bit of that, but, you know, too spread thin. But I think that ability to kind of cross boundaries has been really useful for this effort. Um, I ended up, I'm the chair of our team for the first year, and it's, I think mostly it's not just because it's me. <laughs> it's because I'm a planner, I think, so it's easier for me to kind of get in other people's shoes and kind of see out their perspective than it has been for um, some other disciplines, which I think are a little bit more siloed. And sometimes that's a detriment to us. You know, I feel like we, we know a lot about a lot of things but aren't focused necessarily as much. But in this case, I think it's been um, advantageous. Yeah. You mentioned at the start that after all the position papers or proposals were collected, there was still this book of staff to talk with no one feels free or is part of the environment of city. What were, uh, if you know, some of the other staff and maybe other projects that you may have worked on you were also interested in starting up? Um, you know, it's interesting because that used to be up on the website and it's not there anymore. <laughs> it's disappeared. <laughs> but um, there were four others, right? So, um, and one of them is called Central. Now, they all have no new names. So Central, if anyone, John Claudia is not here, maybe Patricia, I think Central was, it was like kind of the equity, social justice, um, communication piece. But I don't know what the acronym stands for because it's kind of, it's a long one. So there's that piece. Um, there's, what are the other three? I think the one's related to health. Right. Uh, yes, one was related to health. One is related to health. Uh, uh, I, I forgot the exact name, but uh, uh, one is related to um, policy, but uh, they end up not uh, moving forward. <laughs> so someone kind of dropped out. Yeah. The number five. Yeah, I don't remember number five. Sorry. <laughs> ones that are active right now that I know currently are these two and then the central one. Yes, yeah, central. And I think the health ones cooking still. 
and then I guess I think maybe two have dropped out. But yeah, it's a good question. I don't know why it's it's gone. <laughs> That's sure the uh, the the difficulty and the 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 the, the challenge to f put it together is a, a big project. That's because it's not easy. It's we both know that. Yeah. To, uh, back as a community right. or individual um, right and the way we framed it kind of with population growth and climate change those are kind of the big obvious ones but I think you're right that it's much more there's much more layering probably of resilience issues but kind of off the top that piece yes from the climate issue thinking about those natural disasters and Dr. Patterson here so he can chime in on this but the droughts that we have had and we will have and probably will be worse Flooding, you know, in Austin, we have these flood events every couple of years where people actually die in Austin, which just blows my mind that that is happening here in a city with this kind of infrastructure, right? Um, other types of extreme weather events, extreme heat events, especially in urban areas as that gets worse. So that's kind of the, the, the top layer. Um, and then also just thinking about kind of that tension between increase of population within the state that has the same amount of resources, um, but is going to have to grow its services and infrastructure. So kind of kind of community-wide resilience as we grow um, and try to continue that everyone has a pretty good shot at a good life here. Um, but I think you're right that there's layers of thinking about that. So thinking about social resilience, thinking about the most vulnerable populations within our communities and how they experience both the extreme weather events and the population growth differently and the infrastructure services distribution differently, but other aspects of it as well. Um, so that's, and I think that in itself would be kind of at this layer, an amazing research project. And I think that's one of the things that Heather Hauser and I have been talking about doing. Can we really unpack resilience? What does it mean here in Texas? But right now, mostly we've been thinking about kind of those two main drivers of population and climate.
to our uh, special and uh, regular TV forum here. Thank you and enjoy.